we're living in a world where everyone's hypersensitive to viruses and where they are and how they're getting into us. Share with our, our audience here like what we need to know about what viruses are, where they are, how many there are, and how humans and, and viruses interact. Yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating moment on, on the planet right now because never has the microbiome gotten so much attention. So for me, I'm excited that the world is starting to pay attention to what I think is the most important journey that we will take as a species, which is to come to understand that we are not alone. And if we, if we choose to be alone, we will die quickly. And we're right in the midst of that. We are dying faster, younger, every day now and our children in the United States are now screening at about 52% with a chronic disorder or disease by the time they're 17. Uh, this is compared to 1.2% of our children in the 1960s with a chronic disorder or disease. And so we have so poisoned the planet, we have so isolated ourselves from the nature we were, we were developed within uh, that we are now dying and, and experiencing extraordinary levels of chronic disease and disorder that are really threatening the survival of our species. And as we look at human fertility with a drop of 52% of it in our sperm count just over the last 40 years in all Western nations that has occurred. Uh, and we are now at one in three males with sperm counts in the infertile range um, at all ages. And so it's an extraordinary journey into, you know, if we extrapolate that another 30 years, we're going to see, you know, more than 60% of the population with, with an infertility state. And then another 30 years, you're at 85%. And you start to see the end of our species within the next 100 years, some of people thinking as soon as 60 to 70 years. And so I was really preaching that message that we have to reconnect to our microbiome. Uh, every disease now from cancer to heart disease to autoimmune diseases are all now mapping genetically back to the loss of some microbe in the gut. And so we're having to come to terms with the fact that when the soil is disturbed at the gut level, we start to fail in our biology, which is exactly what you see in your backyard garden or in a, a chemical farm. When the nutrients fail to be delivered by a microbial you know, source, you start to get a weakened immune system. You start to get a weakened life force within that plant and they become prone to invasive weeds. So you, have, you pour on the herbicides, invasive pests, so you pour on the pesticides and you're palliating a sick and, and you know, diminished state of life within that crop. And that, I believe, is what we're seeing with our children today. We have a sick and diminished vitality in our children, and we see childhood cancers are skyrocketing. We see everything from leukemias all the way to brain tumors uh, in children under the age of 12 now. Uh, we see sarcomas in children that, you know, that sarcomas when I was in medical school in the 90s was a disease of 80-year-olds. And now suddenly, 15 years later, they're happening in six-year-olds. I've had children die in my clinic, nine-year-olds with metastatic sarcomas. This has never been seen before. And so we have so accelerated the aging process. We have so accelerated that that's the crisis point. But the opportunity is extraordinary. The opportunity we have right now, it will be the biggest scientific awakening, the biggest transformation, paradigm shifting mindset that we've had in 2000 years. The only time that I can find in history where we have changed the significance that we will in the next decade or two in science is when we discovered the earth was round. That shift in Greek science with Pythagoras and other great you know, observers of nature realized we didn't have a flat planet and they started to see clear scientific proof that we were a round planet. And then eventually we would find out that that round planet wasn't the center of the universe spinning around us, we were spinning around everything else. And so this is a, what we're about to go. We're gonna go into a three-dimensional state of understanding instead of a two-dimensional state of understanding of human health. And you guys chose to be physicians right now. It is so exciting. You are so blessed to be a doctor and scientist right now because in 2000 years, nobody's had the opportunity to participate in a paradigm shift like this. Every day in our laboratories, I get goosebumps of what we are seeing because it's never been believed before. We are seeing things happen because for the first time we're taking microbial intelligence and putting it in touch with the human systems in a Petri dish. For all of scientific history, we've been sterilizing that Petri dish to make sure that it's only the human cell in there. And then we study cardiovascular disease, cancer and all this. And we say we understand the disease, but we only understood it as an isolated system. We never came to realize that maybe mother nature could be part of that picture. 
And when we add back Mother Nature to that Petri dish of cancer cells, the cancer simply apoptosis. It goes into program cell suicide. And three days later, you've, you've seen a cleaning up of the system. The healthy cells, when they see the intelligence of nature, reduce their stress at the mitochondria level immediately, which is fascinating to me. The mitochondria is the microbiome within us, right? And so you've got this extraordinary system that you mentioned, you asked for, for the scale of, of the biology around us. Let's start at the bacteria first, because it, it's in and of itself grandiose. But we're around 30,000 species, maybe 40,000 species is probably the ideal microbiome of the human. The typical American is around eight to 10,000 species. Uh, some of them as low as 4,000 species. So we've had this collapse of maybe down to 10 or 15% of our original microbiome. We know that by the American Gut Project that is studying the, the Hadza tribe in Africa and their extraordinary hunter-gatherer lifestyle is still supporting this vast ecosystem. And that quote that you took uh, early on from me was the result of that, that experience with Jeff Leach uh, in Africa, realizing that the gut microbiome was an extension of the greater space around the tribe. And so the tribe was expressing in their gut flora the bacteria that could only be found on zebra hides. And so they were so in touch with their food that, you know, they they're go out for three days, find a herd of zebra, shoot them with their, their bows, will quarter them and carry a, a quartered zebra on their shoulder for three days back to the, to the tribe. Over that time, their skin and body is infused with the flora of zebra, and then they eat the zebra meat. And there is no inflammation, there's no downside as consequence. And I'm fascinated by the possibility that the microbial life of the hide of the zebra might prepare a consumer, whether it be a lion that's tearing apart that zebra or a human. Is it possible that the microbiome of that would actually inform, intelligently inform the gut of the, the carnivore behind it that would then be able to digest that without an inflammatory reaction? Now imagine the American consumer who's never seen a cow yeah, which is actually true. We, you know, this is happening. We brought a journalist with us to one of these farms uh, with Nicole Ragland, our filmmaker uh, for our nonprofit. And uh, they were approaching a farm in, in Pennsylvania. He was from New York City. They're approaching. He suddenly grabbed her arm and said, is that a cow? You know? he, she, it's like, yes, that's a cow. You, <laughs> you can't tell me you've never seen a cow. He had never seen a cow. He's a 32-year-old journalist. And so this is how divorced we are from our food system. And so how is that guy eating a hamburger ever going to have the intelligence of nature baked into that experience? And so I really believe that what we touch is the microbial intelligence. And so as we get divorced from the greater ecosystems, our food system being an obvious one, but also the air we breathe, massive amount of intake through the breath of the microbes around us. So the bacteria, maybe 30, 40,000 species. But then you get to the fungi. Uh, I guess first you've got the parasites. Parasites, 300,000 species. Then you've got fungi at 5 million species. And then you've got the viruses. And we can't keep putting the viruses in the microbiome. They're not living creatures. Uh, if you read you know, like Wikipedia on, on, on microbiome, it defines it as bacteria, parasites, fungi, and viruses with the note that viruses aren't living beings, but because they're so small, we go ahead and ca categorize them as microbiome. Well, the first word, micro, I could see justifying that. The second word, biome, means living sphere, is not going to fit the word virus in it. We have to, as physicians, come to terms with the fact that viruses are not living creatures. They cannot reproduce. They cannot produce energy. They, they, all they are are packages of genetic information for adaptation uh, of, of the species around. And so we exude viral information in the form of exosomes uh, in microRNA, probably by most volume, but also macroRNA and DNA strands are exuded from the human body. And uh, the chief scientist in my lab, John Gilday, PhD in genomics from Johns Hopkins, uh, he has, was the very first publication showing that you could take human exosomes and put them in another biologic system and that genetic information would be absorbed just like a virus would be expected to be able to achieve it. So the exosome is behaving just like a virus. And so we need to stop thinking that viruses are a part of the microbiome, something that's there as this foreign entity. It is literally the genomic you know, adaptation language. It is the language and communication network of the genome between the species. And so we see viruses move around the planet at a volume that boggles the mind. In the air we breathe, 10 to the 31 viruses. In the soil beneath our feet, 10 to the 30 viruses. In the ocean water, 10 to the 31 viruses. And so you start to add that up, 10 to the 30, by the way, is 10 million times more than stars are the entire universe. Okay, these are yeah. numbers that you just can't find in nature. They're so big. 
And now suddenly the CDC or the NIH comes along and says there's six of these viruses that we need to be scared of. Six out of 10 to the what? 31 times three. And so you've got an impossible reality that we currently believe in. It is impossible that the virome is against us. It is impossible that the microbiome is against us. And so after 150 years of believing in the germ theory and believing in, in our necessity for sterilization, we need to rework that understanding. We need to rework that understanding. I wanted to share that, that session with uh, Dr. Bush as our first port of call in this functional forum on uh, immune resilience, because we are living in a very different world than we were living in 10 years ago. And you know, on the very on the second functional forum, we had Dr. Larry Polevsky come and share about this new understanding of microbes. And I think that we have to acknowledge that the world has changed, science has changed over the last few years, and we have to think differently about microbes and how they fit. Now, we may have had a few technical issues at the beginning, and if you haven't spoken on a Zoom meeting and thought you were speaking and realized afterwards that you were muted, then you haven't lived in 2020. So hopefully that was a fun experience for all of you. Welcome uh, to tonight's forum on immune resilience. That was Dr. Zach Bush. Um, his whole interview that I did was about an hour and it was incredible. And um, you can watch the whole thing um, on, uh, I'll send the links out to everyone to watch it. But I just feel like, you know, we, you know, over the last six years on the Functional Forum, the Functional Forum really coincided with this transformational shift in our understanding of microbes from bad guys to, you know, normally good guys. And then the sort of conflation of microbia microbial patterns and viruses has been, you know, even rife inside the functional medicine community. So I thought that was a good opportunity for us to, you know, to start afresh. So I want to continue this theme because we got some other uh, great speakers uh, during, during tonight's show. And so, uh, you know, the next conversation I want to bring us to is really looking at the we're next living conversation in here about that. And uh, we're going to get into um, uh, a little bit with Dr. Jeffrey Bland. So Dr. Bland is someone else that I've, I've, uh, I've interviewed recently, and there were some awesome bits from his interview that I wanted to bring in on this topic. So on this topic, you know, we wanted to ask the question, what's changed? So there you heard from Dr. Bush, what has changed? Now we wanna ask, you know, if, if we wanna hear directly from Dr. Bland, what has changed? And I think this short answer will give you a good idea. If you enjoyed that last interview, or if you have questions, please keep them coming on Twitter, but check out what Dr. Bland says when we talked about what has changed with our understanding of immune resilience. You know, I've, I've heard you talk for a while about this idea of precision public health, and I've got, you know, very interested in it myself. And I, I couldn't help but think that the range of experiences that a range of people in the population have with what's essentially the same virus, you know, obviously sort of unmasks that, that reality. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the, on the nail on the head. You know, we've often thought that a infectious disease is caused by a single organism, in this case, a virus, this uh, specific variant of a COVID virus and that uh, coronavirus. And, and that this um, virus then causes an infection that results in a person having a specific type of uh, set of symptoms and a trajectory in the disease. It's going to be the same because the virus is the same, so the person must have the same disease. You call it the same thing, so it must look the same. And now what we recognize is that the disease is not the virus. Let me say it again. The disease is not the virus. The disease is the interaction of the virus with an individual and their own unique immune system, which produces then their own unique set of outcomes based upon that relationship. And you can't change the virus because it is already locked into its structure. What you can change is the receptivity of the individual to the virus and how it creates that implication of the virus-human interaction that we call the disease. That's the modifiable factor. And what we've recognized is that the biggest factor that relate to that uh, connect, connection between the virus and the person is their lifestyle and the environment and the things that they do to influence their immunological resistance. 
and each person carries with them in their own uh, reserves, their own biological and health reserves, certain aspects of resistance, resilience, or you know, affinity toward, susceptibility toward the infection. That's where we should be spending our time understanding and personalizing. So that was a super interesting segment just to set up this concept of immune resilience. So COVID comes along and shows us there is a wide variety in our, in our resilience amongst the population dependent on the lifestyle. So then we need to get into, you know, yeah, asking I, some different types of questions. There are these, is, and the question we have to ask is, how does lifestyle affect resilience? How does lifestyle affect resilience and what can we each do to build our immune resilience? And as practitioners and doctors in functional medicine, what is like a baseline that patients need to be operating at to make sure that their immune resilience is up to par? And so I asked Dr. Bland, and you'll see here, just to go into detail the science behind how lifestyle affects resilience. And it was really, really clear. So I'll share this with you now. There are these five other sort of fundamentals of health creation, diet, exercise, community, sleep, and stress. And I, I've, I've seen over the years, I've been sitting in the back of lectures and seeing data that shows how each of those have a direct effect on immunity. So could you just take us through each of those briefly and just sort of talk about the sort of the mechanism by which, let's say, food and, and immune health is connected? Yeah, that's great. So what we can start uh, with food, because that's probably the one that people are most familiar with. We know that there are a whole series of nutrients that are found within complex diets that uh, interface with the uh, regulation of our immune system. And, um, you know, our immune system is very fascinating. It, its origin is entirely coming out of our bone marrow. And probably people understand that so so-called hemopoietic stem cells that are in our bone marrow are the origin of all of our both red and white blood cells that are our immune system cells. Uh, and when they come out of the, uh, the bone marrow, uh, they have to be formed correctly with the right kind of integrity. And those bone marrow cells are really dependent upon nutritional status, particularly things like B12, folic acid. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cellular turnover, so the nutrients that are required to make new cells are really then going to uh, be very, very important for the uh, regulation of immune cell formation. And just to give you an idea, every 10 seconds, our bone marrow makes about a million white blood cells, about 20 million red cells, and about 30 million platelets. So it's, it's really actively making new cells all the time, and that is dependent upon specific nutrients that are involved with DNA replication and with, with cellular regeneration. So. That's, that's uh, maybe an obvious example. But then beyond that, beyond the B vitamins, then we get into what about protein? Because we recognize that certain amino acids are very important for immune cell function, arginine being a good example, glutamine being a good, good example. Then we talk about, well, what about other fat-soluble vitamins? Well, we know that vitamin A, retinoic acid, uh, coming out of retinol, is a very, very important part of the uh, immune system um, uh, development. We also know that uh, vitamin D, which has gotten a tremendous amount of attention, is extraordinarily important for regulation of the, um, the personality of our immune system, the so-called innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So uh, I could go down the lexicon of each of the nutrients, but let's just suffice to say, they all have very important roles to play in stabilizing immune system function. So uh, nutrient deprivation or, or chronic nutrient under nutrition can play a very adverse effect on immune function. Let's move that then into exercise. And exercise is a very, very interesting example because you would say, well, hold it now, how can exercise influence the formation of our blood cells that make up our immune system? I mean, exercise is a physical activity. How can it be translated into a, uh, the organic nature of a cell? And it turns out that uh, this is exciting new work that is uh, uh, just really coming about in the last couple of years to recognize that uh, there are receptors on the, on the surface of cells that actually pick up um, the, uh, the effects that the exercise has on our, on our metabolism. As you know, aerobic exercise has a different effect on our metabolism than anaerobic, metabol uh, anaerobic exercise. Anaerobic exercise kind of builds up a different set of metabolites, like lactic acid, for instance, uh, 
that influences how cells work differently than aerobic exercise, where you have more oxygen flowing and you have more um, metabolism of glucose as an energy fuel, and you have different mitochondrial bioenergetics. So exercise sends signals, depending upon the type of exercise, to the body's energetic systems, which are absolutely important in regulating the immune system. Because think about it, our immune system is powered up by energy that's generated by how food is metabolized. And it is one of the more active cell types in all of our body. It's turning over so rapidly, it's eating up energy. And that's why if you eat a, a really high sugar diet, it can actually have an adverse effect on your immune system because it's actually blunting some of the balance that's required for proper nutrition to support the immune system. So we wanna stay away from high sugar when we have an infection and we have an immune insult. We wanna have balanced, uh, you know, uh, kind of time-release glucose that comes as a as minimally refined complex carbohydrate, proper levels of, of um, uh, essential fatty acids, particularly omega-3s that are found to be very important for immune activity. And, uh, and protein, particularly a, a balance of the uh, branch chain amino acids. So all of these particular things then relate to how exercise then connects itself to immune function. Then we go to stress. Well, I mean, it's fairly obvious. I've already talked about the cortisol relationship. Where does cortisol come from? It comes from the adrenal glands, the stress glands uh, sitting on our kidneys. And stress modulates the so-called adrenal cortical system, uh, the sympathetic nervous system. Those compounds that are produced by activation of the uh, stress response, cortisol, DHEA and its metabolites, aldosterone and other uh, members of this family, are agents that are known to again interact with the immune system causing immunosuppression. Just as if I took a cortisol drug, a cortisone drug, over time, it would cause immunosuppression. If our addicted to our stress occurs, we have high levels of cortisol. That can affect our immune system as well. So stress management gives your balance of the hormones that regulate your immune system function, including, by the way, the uh, sex steroid hormones as well. This is one of the reasons that women seem to have um, uh, less exposure or less maybe infection, infection with COVID-19 in that their hormone estrogen or estradiol is an immunoactive hormone that helps to regulate their immune system. Then we go from there to sleep. Well, now we recognize sleep is tightly tied to uh, the circadian rhythms, uh, things that we've learned from Sashtananda Panda at SOC and, and uh, Matt Walker at the uh, University of Cal Berkeley. So these, uh, these biological rhythms, these circadian rhythms, are tied together with our, our clock, our, our circadian clock that is in the brain in the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus of our brain that regulates the clocks in every cell of our body. And why is this important? Because the temporal control of that clock in our brain goes through a gland called the pineal gland. The pineal gland secretes a unique hormone that is called melatonin. And melatonin, when it's secreted into our blood, travels in our blood system to another gland called the thymus gland up here below the thyroid in our base of our neck. And the thymus gland is what regulates how our immune system is functioning. The so-called T cells of our immune system stand for thymus-dependent lymphocytes, which are part of our regulatory system. So we then see sleep can pattern and program the production of melatonin, which in turn programs the thymus gland's uh, control over immunity. So all these things work together as a network to regulate our immune vigilance. So you can see hopefully why I wanted to include that clip because you know there's so much that we can do as functional medicine practitioners to be able to help patients build immunity, but we have to do the fundamentals right. You can see those four fundamentals and obviously throw in a fifth fundamental would be community. And um, I did talk about that a little bit on the interview, but immune, uh, community you know, and, and social isolation has a distinct effect on immunity. And, uh, and so that's a, a huge issue for us to, to understand as well. And how do we do that? Like, how do we do that in practice? Well, one of the things that we've seen is that uh, 
you know, is is obviously group visits. And, you know, hopefully now that that states are starting to open up, there's opportunity to group visits. And this is our sponsor for the Functional Forum, which is the uh, uh, Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center that makes these group visit toolkits. They have one called the Essentials of Immune Health. So if you're not already doing group visits, if you wanted to think about what is a topic that I could do, check out the essentials of immune health. Never been a hotter topic. And certainly this is makes functional medicine and the lifestyle delivery that you just heard about. The most important things that you have to do in order to maintain immune resilience. Here's a way that you can do it in groups that's easy to implement, cost effective, time efficient and insurance friendly. Inside the group visit toolkit for the essentials of immune health, you've got soap notes. One of the biggest things about the soap notes is, is you get in this system, you get the patient to fill in 80% of their soap note. All of that stuff in white is uh, for the patient to fill in. Um, you have event flyers if you wanna put on events in your local community. There's PowerPoint slides that you can use to, uh, you can uh, adapt for your presentation. There's Dr. Saxena speaking over those same slides so that you can just use her um, as, as um, content if you want. And then there's all kinds of patient uh, handouts. So, you know, as an example, look to understand uh, detoxification, liver conjugation. How many times have you had to say that story? Have a great handout, make it easy for people to use. So if you go to goevomed.com slash GBT, we also have a group visit practitioner interest group where we run a group visit challenge. We've done it twice. We did it in, uh, back in December. We did it actually a few weeks ago where we're making it easy for people to get started with their group visits. So go and check those out. Now, yes, lifestyle is important, right? So we need to get the lifestyle ready. But why is functional medicine so critical to immune resilience? And this is a bit of a controversial topic, but I asked Dr. Bland on it on that same interview. And I just think it's so critical. Like Americans take a large percentage of the whole drugs in the world. And ultimately we have a lot of people who are on pharmaceuticals. And I think one of the things that's shown up in this whole COVID thing is just what to what degree that is affecting our immune resilience. So I asked Dr. Bland about it. And I really think this is important because if there's the one thing that we could say that functional medicine is capable of, of getting to the root cause, getting people off medication. And we have to get people off medication because of the fun of what it does to function. So listen in to this. I think this is a critical point. And this is why I think functional medicine is so well positioned to be a leader in an era of everyone really wanting to understand immunity. It's likely that these are having like the overuse of those medications, you know, is leading to partly why America's response to the virus is worse than other countries because we just have a much greater use of that specific xenobiotic throughout society than any other country. Well, I think you're raising an extraordinarily important topic. Um, let me just, before I kind of respond, let me give a factoid. In the United States today, there are approximately, depending on what statistics you want to use, uh, anywhere between 10 and 20 million people, probably that's a conservative estimate, who are on what we call immunosuppressive drugs. And by the name immunosuppressive, <laughs> it means that it's having an effect on the immune system by suppressing its activity. And as a consequence, if you look at the labeling on some of these drugs, what are called black, spot, black box labeling, uh, the, the labeling on the drug will say this drug may reduce your immune system efficiency such that you now have a risk of opportunistic infection, like tuberculosis that was laying dormant because your immune system kept it quiet, but now that we're suppressing your immune system with this drug, now it can gain a, a, a new foothold. Or Epstein-Barr virus, it'd be another example of something that was maybe held in check, or herpes, that, that are held in check with an immune system that's uh, functional, but when you suppress it, now it has a chance to kind of be reignited. The concept of immunosuppressive drugs is kind of part of this xenobiotic, because these are foreign uh, foreign molecules or molecules that are unique to the individual that are creating this suppression of their immune system function. Uh, it may also be uh, antibodies to their own immune system activity, like the anti-TNF antibodies, but they all then limit the body's normal regulatory process to how it responds to the outside and inside world. Now, with that in mind, let's go to your model. What happens if you take a drug that was designed 
to be effective for the short term to manage a crisis health problem if you start extending the use of that drug in chronic problems that go on for months, years, and maybe decades. Remembering that virtually every drug that's approved has had a limited study in duration of its application to the patient that are being, that are being treated. So a long-term study might be six months, maybe in some exceptional examples, a year. But in most cases, the, the intervention trials that uh, are used to approve uh, pharmaceutical drugs are, are of shorter duration in the, in the order of many months. Therefore, when we see that they have a positive benefit and that their risk to adverse effects are low, it gives us confidence that those drugs must be approved and supported by our Food and Drug Administration as safe and effective. But what's the difficulty then when we take that drug that was approved for a short-term use and we start extending it out now just beyond months, but years and even decades of application. This is an experiment that really we don't have any data on, except the people that are taking it. And we've got some interesting information about what happens when those things occur. Let me give you the classic example that everyone would cite in pharmacology as to the difference between short-term administration of a drug and long-term of that same drug. And this was the most significant singular discovery made in American pharmacology, actually global pharmacology, um, that occurred in the 1930s and 40s. It came after the discovery of antibiotics, and it was the discovery of cortisone and cortisol. And you might recall when the first pharmaceutical drugs that were produced that were derivatives of the body's natural cortisol, which has an immune uh, suppressing effect was made available for medicine to prescribe, it was like unheard of revolution. People that were sick and feeling horrible and low energy and chronic pain, when they took these cortisone derivatives, had just like, uh, were being reborn. And the testimonials that you can go back and read were so remarkable that it was felt early on that this was a wonder drug class of drugs that people could remediate all sorts of problems with by taking these drugs indefinitely. And the enthusiasm around these drugs was unbounded. What year was that? What year was peak enthusiasm? So this would be like the, the 50s and coming into the early 60s. Okay. And then we found that as people were sustained on these drugs for a period of time, not just in the short-term treatment of acute inflammation, but long-term, that all sorts of things started to happen. Their skin started to thin and they started bruising and, and having skin lesions. Their bones started to thin. They became, it, it adversely affected their cardiovascular system. It made them more susceptible to infection. So suddenly people said, well, hold up, these wonder drugs, they were so great for short-term application. When we extend this, the wonder doesn't discontinue on. It turns the bends the curve and now these drugs actually start killing the person. Sounds like a diminishing marginal return to me. That's the example I'm using. Exactly. So you won't find now any responsible physician using long-term corticosteroid drugs for the management of a patient unless there's really an extreme reason for doing that. And they follow those patients very, very carefully because the adverse effects over long terms are very, very serious. So we could take that example of the corticosteroid drugs and apply it to many other drug families and start to see what happens over longer term administration in terms of bending the curve from good into not so good. So a few critical points so far, you know, we've, got, we've heard from Dr. Zach Bush that, you know, we've reached a complete tipping point in the way that we understand about microbes. And we can't go back to the old way of thinking, that thinking the microbiome is against us or the virome is against us. That these are, you know, that we live in harmony with these things. And when things get out of harmony, this is evolution in, in real time. And then, you know, starting off with Dr. Bland, really starting to understand that, you know, the disease that we're seeing, that we're calling COVID is really not the microbe, it's the microbe and the host being interact, you know, interacting together. We heard about the sort of fundamentals of health creation that affect our immune resilience significantly. Diet, exercise, sleep, stress, and community. 
And right there, you hear about why it's so important that we need to be getting people off medication if we want to improve their immune resilience. And that immune resilience is a function of your vitality. And you know, many of these drugs are having debilitating, debilitating effects on our immune resilience. And you know, mainstream medicine is not really trained to get people off medication. And that's why our community is so, so critical and important. So I hope you found that uh, interesting. I wanted to go on to our next theme. So, so far we've looked at like, what do we have to do clinically, theoretically? What are we here to do? But ultimately, you know, the functional forum has always been about, about clinical stuff, but also practice management. How do we put this into practice? And so I reached out to Dr. Susan Bloom, who most of you know, is a leader in immune health. I mean, she's an educator, she's an author, she has an awesome clinic in Westchester. And I wanted to reach out to her just to share like, what does an episode of care look like for her? And obviously she's got a lot of people coming into her practice who have serious immune conditions. So she's starting with people who are kind of the bottom of the barrel. Ultimately, what I want to share here today was that for most people who aren't at the bottom of the barrel, we really need to focus on the lifestyle behaviors. And that's why we've been hot on group visits and health coaching and that kind of structure, because most people just need that. But we talked to Dr. Susan Bloom, because likely the kind of people with serious immune dysfunction are people who are coming into offices just like yours. So I asked Dr. Bloom how, you know, let's, let's talk about what does an episode of care look like to really help people build back their immune resilience. And this was the great segment that she shared. Take us through the, the process of, of, you know, how do you, uh, help people identify where the sort of holes are in their immune resilience and, and what is the program or sort of what does an episode of care look like in your practice to deliver on this kind of uh, this, this, this concept? Okay, so the first thing uh, to keep in mind, so to provide a framework, right? So for me, I'm thinking of what are the foundations of a healthy immune system and what do I want to know about? And you can think of them as pillars or foundations. And the first is going to be food, right? So want to know about the food. The second is going to be stress and hormones. So we're going to want to know about that. The third is going to be gut health. And the fourth big bucket, I would say, is toxicity, which I know you've already dug into a little. And so for me coming in, so I have very clear, We I spend two hours with an, those of you out there listening to this, I know you spend a lot of time taking care of your patients or seeing them, but I spend a lot of time with a thorough intake form where I really want to know everything about your diet, a three-day diet history, everything you've ever tried, right? So really digging, learning about you and the food. This is speaking about my patients. I really want to know stress history, trauma, really getting a good history. And so some of this is the intake forms, because you can save a lot of time by helping, by having people provide you really thorough past medical histories, as well as um, personal history, social history, all the history. And you want to know, and in, in the matrix we do, we talk about that as sort of antecedents, right? You want to really understand the antecedents and what someone's background and history is, as well as right now what's going on in terms of mediators that are keeping things going. And the buckets, again, you want to dig into the food, you want to really understand the stress system, which is which bumps into all the hormones, and um, and then you really want to understand: is this a gut person? Is this a person with lifelong digestive issues? Right, because we know that estimates are seventy or eighty percent. Everyone says one or the other um, of the immune system is in the gut, you know, intestinal lining. And so, a healthy gut is a healthy immune system. You need to assess your person's gut, and then you really want to do a thorough sort of history for toxin exposure, as well as get a sense of whether you think they have a high toxin load now, which could be like an MSQ or you know something like that. But you have to get a sense, is this person, do I think this person has very a, lot, a big toxin load? Do I think this person is, needs gut work really badly? What's the diet like? How, you know, how much work do I need to do with that? And what's the stress system like? And cord not just cortisol, but that bumps into thyroid and sex hormones. And what's the endocrine system look like? And, um, and when you do a really thorough intake with the forms they fill out, as well as spending time really getting to know someone and digging in and asking all these questions, you know, that little functional medicine detective and the, um, you know, my intuition and not just intuition, but the data sort of sort of directs you to where the priorities are, you know, where you think the biggest imbalances are for this person. 
And how do you organize from there, sort of like the, co the right combination of taking action and getting more information? Um, at the first visit, I always work with, so everyone, you have to start with food. Like food is a foundational piece that everybody has to, that has to be addressed for everybody because, you know, an anti, what's an anti-inflammatory diet? You know, the first simplest thing might be just identifying all the inflammatory foods and sort of habits that somebody has and try to help teach them sort of options to not eat all that sugar and to start eating more healthy fat and eating more color and fruits and vegetables, like moving them towards a healthier um, anti-inflammatory food plan. Um, that's a foundation because that's going to carry you at every visit. Like every visit you have to be working with someone. At Blum Center, we have a nutrition, every new patient gets a nutrition visit, visit and everyone gets a health coach visit. So it's part of a package. So generally I sort of tee it up and I'll tell, I'll explain to people sort of where I'm seeing the issues with their food that might be affecting the immune system. So why is an inflammatory diet bad for the immune system? We know that sugar, for example, which is inflammatory because it triggers inflammatory mediators, also suppresses immune response. So it affects the immune system and inflammation is bad for the immune system. And so you really have to help people and the immune system needs tons of antioxidants. And you know this thing called oxidative stress, we have to make sure you know, that people have enough antioxidants for detoxification, that they have enough fiber for the gut, for gut health. They, we need to make sure that um, not only are we uh, giving those immune soldiers of the immune uh, system army uh, the ammunition they need, which are antioxidants and, um, you know, and vitamins to do their work, but we really want to make sure we're supporting good gut health, supporting detoxification. So food is the foundation for everything. And so it's an assessment, but it's also counseling. So I send people home with what I want them to do and food lists. And I say, you're going to, and I schedule them a nutrition visit. It's that important because not only are we, you know, and then there's an elimination diet and we can talk about all those therapeutic food plans that we do with functional medicine. But in the long run, you want to teach people what are the lifelong changes that we want you to make? Because that's for lifelong immune health, right? Lifelong, you need to eat for your gut. Lifelong, you need to eat for detoxification. Lifelong, you need to eat enough antioxidants. And so um, there's a foundation piece that I really focus on in addition to some sort of, you know, elimination or what, what do we, we want to do depending on their specific food issues. So I always start with food at the first visit. They get in, there's always very clear sort of discussion around that. Um, and that's going to carry through all the visits. Um, I always talk about stress at the first visit because that, again, is going to be a flavor that carries through. I want to really know, is there trauma? Is there, you know, we know people with high ACEs scores and adverse childhood events in childhood, they're going to have an increased risk to their immune system as an adult. And so I'm very into, um, and very, that's a passion of mine, is to really make sure that we talk about that. And so this, this is, in a way, creating that relationship, right? We're creating that healing supportive, mutually respect relationship where we start talking about food and stress. And these are foundations for lifestyle medicine, right? And that's the first thing you want to get going. And then at the first visit, I'll make a decision whether I think I want to start digging into the, if this is a gut person, or I think this is a person with a high toxin load that I need to start with, we're addressing toxins or addressing the gut. And a lot of times, like there's a little fork in that road. Um, most of the time, I, I, I always make sure anyone with really big gut issues through history and as we're talking about it through symptoms, I never do any detox work with anyone until the gut is okay. So in my own mind, I'm also making sure, seeing if the gut's okay. If it is, I might, and there have, I think toxins are a big issue for this person, I'll start with toxins. Otherwise, I really start with the gut. So if you've ever seen that diagram, uh, that is, or, you know, the Venn diagram that shows autoimmune conditions, you see, uh, you see three inter intersecting circles, genetic predisposition, uh, environmental uh, issues, and gut permeability. And so Dr. Dr. Bloom is really working there on those, you know, those two modifiable areas and trying to get an idea of which bucket these patients fit into. And ultimately, I'm sure, you know, in your clinic, you're working with, you know, all different types of autoimmune conditions from the very mild to the very serious. Um, but ultimately, you know, we have to, as a community, step up to be able to deliver more when it comes to immune resilience. You know, if the numbers of COVID taught us anything, it's that 
different people had a widely different interaction with you know with with the same microbe and in that way um, you see that what dr bland said at the beginning is absolutely true is that we have we what we really need to do is to massively improve um, immune resilience in the population and so you know one of the things that we you know we've been talking about for years at the functional forum the combination of technology and coaching and groups as the three ways to really bring scale affordability and structure where people can change behavior and get healthy and in this case it it, it makes a lot uh, it makes a big impact towards their ability to be immune resilient so I'd love to hear questions, thoughts. If you have questions below, uh, please, you can put them in the comments. Uh, you, can, you can tweet me over here uh, at the, uh, uh, as we're going through the show. Um, take us to, through that. Take you through into to the next point. So, you know, ultimately here at the Functional Forum, you know, what we, we, would, we wanted to just share some of the best clips from some of the interviews that we've been doing this month and really align ideas towards this idea of immune resilience. And this topic is gonna to be coming up more and more. Uh, one of the things I didn't share at the beginning because I was muted uh, was that, uh, you know, normally with this functional forum, we have been uh, in the June functional forum, we've been reporting from uh, the IFM annual conference, which the last five years we've gone to and made a show off the back of. And this year, the conference is all virtual. It's happening in uh, two weeks. And uh, on the day before, on Thursday, the 11th of uh, June, I will be live with Dr. Tironi Lodog uh, for a special interview on behalf of Fullscript, where we're gonna be talking about the transformation that's happening in medicine, what COVID has done to kind of change the game and uh, what we can expect from there. So that's nine o'clock Pacific, 12 o'clock uh, Eastern on the 11th of June. So mark your calendars for that. I think it's gonna be a really, really interesting uh, interview. So I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation on immune resilience. I think there's lots of great points there. Um, it's really been great to have Zach Bush on the Functional Forum. Um, I will share in the show notes the link to my whole interview with him. Uh, in that interview, he really went deep into understanding the role that toxicity plays in immune resilience. And if you remember back to the PLMI webinar that we did in April, and Dr. Ari Bojdani's slide, it showed the different things that affect our um, immunity and our ability to ward off something like COVID-19. And right in the middle of that, at the top, was um, you know uh, looking at total toxicity that the body has has uh, been in touch with. And it was really interesting to hear his concepts on toxicity and how the different parts of toxicity had played into uh, individuals' immune resilience. So I want to finish uh, with one other presenter, and he wasn't he wasn't uh, put on the you know on this uh, slide ahead of time. You know we didn't have him down for the conversation about immune resilience. But ultimately, if we want to talk about resilience, uh, we really need to talk about societal resilience and over the next four months on the functional forum we're going to dive deep into uh, different types of different conversations around resilience so this was about immune resilience next month we're going to be talking about the technology of resilience we're going to be talking about how technology can play a role in help us understanding resilience we're going to be talking to doctors like molly maloof who's on the cutting edge of understanding how technology uh, can have an impact uh, in, in understanding and, and measuring resilience. Uh, in August, we've got an awesome show planned. We're gonna be talking about uh, community resilience. So we're gonna be hearing about one of the most exciting projects in medicine, uh, which is the Adventist Health Project that is being headed up by a functional medicine doctor. Not only that, um, if you've seen the news recently, you have seen that Adventist has bought the Blue Zones project or acquired the Blue Zones project. So that means that Aventist is now really in the business of health creation. And so I'm super excited to dig into that um, a little bit uh, in August. And then in September, we'll be talking about practice resilience. And we're gonna be showcasing people who, um, and practices that developed uh, practice resilience 
in this time of COVID. And later in the fourth quarter of this year, we have some really exciting announcements to facilitate real community uh, wherever you might be. So I want to share this closing interview. It's with Dr. David Katz. I interviewed him last week, actually on Friday, and I really wanted to put this little segment in because you know, ultimately we are living in one of the most unprecedented times uh, in human history. And I didn't even know whether we should do the Functional Forum live tonight because of what is happening in America and around the world today, but specifically in America. And, you know, Dr. David Katz has been on the front lines and has written some incredible uh, articles and has got a lot of press and has popped up in places you don't normally see doctors from our community um, in on Bill Maher and on Fox News and in the New York Times, really talking about, you know, what is going to be the long term ramifications of, um, you know, of COVID and then also of shutting down the economy for almost three months. And I think Dr. Katz has been really bang on because he really cares about the social determinants of health. And it was a really great interview that he shared. But at the end of it, um, kind of, I just asked him what his thoughts were about this particular topic, about immune resilience, and particularly about the practitioners that practice immune resilience. And I want to share his answer because hopefully it's as inspiring to you as it was to me. Enjoy. You know, you've stood up at a time that it, it wasn't kind of like the easy thing to do and, and talk about these kind of things. And there's the naturopathic community and the lifestyle community and the functional medicine community and the sort of integrated medicine community. What do you think is the importance of clinicians in those spaces um, at a local level, maybe not at a national level, to, to talk the talk that you're talking right now? I, I, you know, I, I think it's really important. I, I believe... Uh, wholeheartedly in the importance of, of solidarity and consensus. Not that all of us need to agree about everything, but you know, because we're such a polarized society, and because everything you know reverberates through both traditional media and, in particular, social media, and because you can go shopping online for the opinion you already own, and it's easy to wind up in your tribe and oppose every other tribe. I think it's really important for us to come together across disciplines when we agree about most things, right? So, you know, these disciplines are separate because we do have some differences. But if we agree 80% about what's most important, let's put the 20% to the side right now, come together, and, and let's say, here's the part we all agree. And as you know, I, I created the True Health Initiative for that very reason. And, and by the way, that's where we've archived all uh, detailed materials about total harm minimization and risk stratified interdiction. So people can go to truehealthinitiative.org to learn more. But we created that as a place where people with very diverse perspectives could come together and say, you know, I, I prefer a vegan diet, I prefer a Mediterranean diet, but we agree overwhelmingly that the best diets are real food, not too much, mostly plants. You know, I mean, we're, we agree about 90%, 95%. All you ever hear us talk about is the 5%. I think A is best, she thinks B is best. But, you know, again, you never hear us say, yeah, but 95% of A and B are the same. So I, I think, you know, what you just described, all these different disciplines that care about this, that care about leveraging lifestyle as medicine, that care about treating the root causes, that care about the, the, the value proposition of disease prevention, health promotion, that believe the right measure is vitality, overall vitality, not the prevention of just one disease. Now is our time to come together and say, this high level of vulnerability to the pandemic is not necessary. Uh, we ought to do all we can to prevent a next pandemic, but there may be one. Let's not be as vulnerable next time. There may be recurring waves of this. Let's not be as vulnerable if there are. Let's take advantage of the lessons in this pandemic to get healthy. And, you know, we all agree that there's a huge opportunity. We all agree about the fundamental components. We all agree that diet is critical. Physical activity is critical. Not smoking is critical. Managing stress. You know, again, you look across the, the, these different these schools of thought that you just mentioned, um, overwhelmingly our platforms align. If it were a Venn diagram, that, that spot in the middle where we all come together would be big, and it's what's most important, and it's leverageable right now. So yes, I think this is the time to bring those communities together. So I'm counting on you to make that happen, James. He's counting on me to make that happen. And you know, I want nothing more than to make that happen. And so, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, if we really want to talk about resilience and we really want to build resilience on a individual level, on a family level, 
on a community level, on a national level, on an international level, our medicine has to come to the fore. And I'm gonna you know, double and triple down in this next phase to be able to try and help our community really go past the divisions that have kept each part of us separate. Like Dr. Kat said, you know, we agree on 90% across the integrative, naturopathic, functional, holistic, preventive, predictive medicine, all of it. You know, we, we agree. And ultimately we need to find ways to be able to come together. I chose the name, the Functional Forum for this show because I believe that functional medicine has the potential to be a common language, right? You hear what Dr. Susan Bloom talked about here today with the, with the, you know, the matrix. You heard Dr. Bland when he talked about the, the fundamentals that sit on the bottom of the matrix. When I saw the matrix, I felt like this was a way for us to have a common language so that teams of practitioners could work together so that we could actually prove that this model of care worked. And ultimately over the next six months, I'm gonna you know, really dive deep into what Dr. Katz said there and try my hardest to be able to facilitate real connection between our community. And that's by putting people in the same room together. And ultimately I feel like we have to model this for the rest of the community. And that's the reason why I really wanted to do the show tonight and not put it off in crazy circumstances, you know, that we now live in, in this country. And if we are really going to come together, we need to showcase that togetherness. We need to showcase that togetherness in our community. And that's by breaking down the barriers that have kept us separate. That's by bringing together patients in community with things like group visits, this is our time. And I really appreciate and acknowledge the role that you've played in helping your community with their health up until this point. And I know that you have a deep desire to do it even more. And I'm here to support, the evolution of medicine is here to support. And as a community, we can step forward into this gap that has been created by really the you know, big problems in primary care and family medicine that this type of medicine, that functional medicine when delivered at scale with groups and health coaches and practitioner teams and technology can become a new standard of care. So we'll be showcasing that over the next few months with the technology of resilience and the, um, you know, with the technology of resilience, community resilience, practice resilience, leading into a fourth quarter with some really, really cool surprises on how we're going to build community. So thank you so much for being here. We will see you on the 13th of November, uh, on, of July. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.